Since lately I've been discussing quite a lot about the French Revolution at school, well, it's pretty much something you're going to find in every European history textbook, I thought I should tell you there might have also been something overlooked in this whole network of causes leading to it. So that something brings us to the land of ice and fire. Here you have the fascinating story about what is probably the greatest eruption ever recorded in Iceland and uh, an eruption which might have at least indirectly hastened the outbreak of the French Revolution. Welcome to my channel, this is Irina. You'll find here content on uh, Viking, Scandinavian and German culture. Have a go at it and if you do enjoy it, please help me with a like and subscribe. And allow me to briefly but wholeheartedly recommend a great site where you can acquire truly exquisite merchandise from this majestic island. The site is simply called buyfromiceland.com. Here you will find the largest selection of books from Icelandic authors written in English but also in several other languages, uh, from literature to art albums as well as a lot of local candy with interesting flavors. So get something original or wrap it up as a gift with free shipping if you use the code Irina Skuld, which is the name of my channel. While the country has experienced many eruptions since it was in 874, none has been as devastating as the Laki eruption that started in 1783 and lasted for no fewer than eight months. Well, this one and Iceland even had a bigger basaltic eruption in 934, the Eldgjau eruption that produced almost 20 kilometers, cubic kilometers of lava. To be clear, the mountain known as Laki did not erupt, instead fissures opened up on each side of it after groundwater interacted with rising basaltic magma. The fissure is called Lakagigar, part of the volcanic system that centers on the Grimsvötn volcano. To give you an idea where the eruption took place, well, this volcanic fissure lies along the south of Iceland near to the magnificent Elkia I mentioned before. The word directly translates to the Canyon of Fire, by the way. Kirkjubaira Kloister, not the easiest thing in the world to pronounce, is very close to Eldkjau. It's a um, very small community. From June the 8th, 1783 until the 7th of February, 1784, the Laki Fisher and Grimsvörten volcano poured out toxins. An astounding 14.7 cubic kilometers of basaltic lava, as well as poisonous hydrofluoric acid and sulfur dioxide were released into the soil and air. And this came out of 140 vents along a 23 kilometer long set of fissures and cones. Now, Laki was unusual in that it had tapped an underground magma chamber that was rich in fluorine. In low doses in humans, this element can have beneficial effects, such as the hardening of tooth enamel and the st stabilizing of bone mineral. Um, that's why we use toothpaste. But high doses result in fluoride poisoning. For more than 7,000 square kilometers around Laki, the ground was heavily salted with fluorine and the 8 million tons of hydrogen fluoride that was released caused dental and skeletal fluorosis in the animals. In these conditions, death was actually a blessing. Like most volcanic eruptions, the Skaftaur fires, as they are known in Iceland, started with a series of earth earthquakes first noticed three to four weeks before the eruption started on June the 8th. Now, likely there were many smaller and deeper earthquakes that preceded the earthquakes that were felt at the surface, but in the late 1700s, that was really impossible to figure out as there was no such thing as a seismometer to measure these smaller earthquakes. And um, if the eruption of Eyjafjallajökull from 2010 is any indication, these earthquakes could start months to years in advance of an eruption. But in 1783, only earthquakes that were felt could be noticed. Once the eruption began, each pulse of the eruption followed a similar sequence. Earthquakes, a new fissure, short explosive eruptions, um, as lava interacted with the water table, e uh, we're calling them Strombolian explosions, and then Hawaiian explosions, which basically means a lava flow. Some of the explosive components of the eruption produced plumes that reach 15 kilometers, while lava fountains were about 800 to uh, 1400 meters tall. So it was one huge river. You can try to imagine that pretty catastrophic. 
The lava flow destroyed 20 villages. The sulfur dioxide released by the lava flow stayed close to the ground within 5 kilometers in Iceland, creating acid rains that were strong enough to burn holes in leaves. The soil contamination led to the death of over 80% of the sheep, 50% of the cattle and 50% of all horses in Iceland. Most of the crops you can imagine were wiped out as well. The haze famine, as it is called in Iceland, killed all over 10,000 people, which was about 22% of the population at the time. So many people didn't really die because of the explosions, the eruption, but they died because of famine and disease. One person committed to recording this whole disaster was the Icelandic priest Jón Steingrimsson, who lived between 1728 and 1791. He's also known as the fire priest because of his uh, account, the Eldklerkur. This wasn't really a great century to be around, not only because of all the uh, volcanoes running amok, such as Öræfajökull, Katla and Hekla, other famous examples of volcanoes in Iceland, but also because of the whole smallpox and leprosy. Um, Jung's narrative Eldritid is a detailed account of the day-to-day -day events associated with the eruption and a description of the progression of the uh, lava flow. He recorded it because he wanted the human experience of the eruption not to be forgotten. So his vivid depiction of trauma, of drama, is the main highlight of the work, although it does not lack in accuracy and wealth of detail. The poisonous compounds caused, as Jón depicts so graphically, the skin to rot off the spines of horses, um, swelling in their heads, jaws and joints, rotting insides and shrinking bones. And the meat of the animals, as a consequence, was both foul smelling and bitter and full of poison, so that many a person died as a result of eating it. This we find out from the account Fires of, um, of the Earth. The trout, which once teemed in the rivers Geilansau and Hegalansau, were choked out by flood diversion and humans fared little better. So those, those who had not prepared for these times of pestilence quickly showed the signs of starvation on their bodies and their gums swelled and cracked. Many suffered irregular heartbeats, uh, diarrhea, hair loss, general sickness and weakness. The illnesses, as Jón rightfully suspected, were caused by the consumption of contaminated water, meat, poison food supplies, as well as the inhalation of toxic air. Jón's wife of just 31 years old died from these complications and kidney disease herself in 1784. All the water in his district turned acrid to the taste, uh, plants burnt and the air turned thick and bitter so that most people found it very difficult to breathe. The valuable Angelica route along the canyons was decimated and meadows turned barren and sandy. So the once beautiful and fertile um, area Fljotskverbi was now laid waste. He tried helping others uh, by attending the sick, for example, and by even defying the Danish government officials by directly distributing some funds. He is especially biting towards the greedy who survived the ordeal through hoarding supplies, buying up available healthy livestock and treating the needy mercilessly. When help finally arrived from the government in Copenhagen, uh, far too late, as he notes, the Monies barely met the needs of the affected districts. Those who had healthy livestock were able to set their own prices and decided to exploit the desperation of their fellow humans rather than sell at more normal costs. Avarice was, however, in vain, as many of those taking advantage eventually suffered misfortune and death themselves. The money they earned through overpriced livestock perhaps could have helped them restore their farms. Um, if there weren't, if um, it weren't for the fact that the government insisted on collecting rents and debts despite the economic crisis caused by the eruption. So does this story seem any bit familiar to you? I think it does. Those in charge of grain su surpluses were too slow in providing instructions for rationing the supplies. And this is another aspect that caused further death in the famine that followed the poisonous ash clouds. The descriptions are as impressive as terrifying. To quote a little bit from his book, he says the following. The area was one of continuous sea of flame from Dalsfjatl to the edge of the new lava. The fire cast my shadow as if I were walking in bright moonlight. Furthermore, trustworthy men reported there was almost as much light in the Öræfi region which lay spread 
in the opposite direction a good day's journey away, as the fires reached so high into the air at that time. Here in Cedar, we set out on a wood gathering expedition down to the tidal flats, where we had light from this fire to guide us over the difficult patches in the night darkness. So a traumatic event dealt with in many ways from despair to compassion to self-interest. But the trauma extended beyond Iceland. The event had a profound impact on people living in the northern hemisphere for years to come. The sulfur dioxide entered the jet stream and was circulated around the entire northern hemisphere. The haze quickly reached Europe and by July 1st, 1783, the haze was also noticed in China. There are not many records from North America that mention the arrival of the Lucky Haze, but we do have tree ring records from northern Alaska suggesting that July and August 1783 were particularly cold. Almost 90% of that sulfuric acid was removed in the form of acid rain or fogs, while 10% stayed aloft for over a year. This might explain why northern hemisphere temperatures were about 1.3 degrees Celsius below the normal for two or three years after the eruption. We also have an interesting record from the British naturalist Gilbert White, who described that summer in his classic natural history of Selborne as an amazing and portentous one, the peculiar haze or smoky fog that prevailed for many weeks in this island. The sun at noon looked as blank as a clouded moon and shed a rust-colored ferruginous light on the ground and floors of rooms, but was particularly lurid and blood-colored at rising at setting. At the same time, the heat was so intense that butcher's meat could hardly be eaten on the day after it was killed, and the flies swarmed so in the lanes and hedges that they rendered the horses half frantic. The country people began to look with a superstitious awe at the red, luring aspect of the sun. To go back to the first idea in the video, the disruption caused to the economies of Northern Europe where food poverty was a major factor played a part in the build-up to the French Revolution of 1789 as well. The event might have been one piece of the puzzle along a lot of social unrest and political discontent. And it is a sobering reminder that destructive changes to the environment can have long-lasting and far-reaching impacts even from hundreds of kilometers away. In conclusion, Laki did not erupt as bombastically as uh, Indonesia's Krakatoa, for example, whose explosion in 1883 sent shock waves racing around the globe seven times, or Mount Pele in the Caribbean island of Martinique, which in 1902 obliterated a town of 30,000 people within minutes. However, it was an insidious killer. The eruption and its aftermath have become a benchmark for measuring all other painful episodes in uh, Iceland's history, and Icelanders even have a word for it, the modu harvindin, meaning the hardship of the fog. Today, the lava field known as uh, the Eldhrein, literally the lava of fire, is a great monument of nature and power. And as you drive along the main road between the villages of Vik and Kirkjubara Kloster, you will see the Eldhrein covered with green moss everywhere around you, making the landscape seem uh, magical and mysterious at the same time. So a little bit of food for thought. Well, I really do hope you enjoyed this uh, story. And if you did, please hit the subscribe button for much more about Iceland and uh, generally speaking, the Germanic world. Till next time, all the best.